Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. If you could comply to anything, it would be great if you chose to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by BoyinBlack13X. Ex-husband Ghost's ex-wife racks up a huge bill. He clearly didn't think things through. I'm working in the billing queue in a call center for one of the big three telcos and a client calls in regarding a billing concern. This lady calls in, is puzzled by why she got charged a one-time fee $49 for a wireless access point. It's genuine equipment for wireless set-top boxes for Optic TV. She's even more puzzled why she would have that charge when she doesn't have TV services from us. And I inform she does. It started more or less a month ago. She's disputing that because Optic TV isn't available in her area. Now I'm confused. She lives in a small town and there's no Optic TV there. I do a little digging and find that someone, now ex-husband, was still on her account and got a three-year contract to get a free TV for Optic TV and internet. She begins to cry on the phone and tells me her now ex-husband had an affair with a younger woman, divorced her, milked her for as much as he could, and apparently is still milking her for more. He totally ghosted her. Moved to Alberta, changed his email, phone number, blocked her on all social media, etc. In my mind, I'm like, what a jerk. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, if you cancel the services, you're on the hook to pay for cancellation fees and so on. I can tell her though, I can remove his access to your account. And you can also add on a password, downgrade the internet and TV to the bare essentials, and I can attempt to redirect the TV gift from his address to hers, but there's no guarantee as it's been processed already. I can hear the light going off in her head. She says, wait, what? You have where he's living at now? I say, why, yes, he's got TV and internet services, so there's a service address. She goes really quiet. Says her lawyer and herself have been trying to track him down, but his family and friends are being tight-lipped about it. She asks if I'm allowed to give that info to her. I smile and reply, this is your account. You have unrestricted access for service addresses and emails that your now ex-husband provided to us to get hooked up. She asks that I can give her his new address, his new cell number, and the second number left on the account, presumably the new woman, and contact info over the phone right now. I asked if she had a pen and paper handy. She was so ecstatic. And after giving her all the details from her account regarding the second service address, downgrade everything, and he was a hockey fan and there was a game playing right now with his team. So I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when the game cuts out and he calls in to ask what the freak and discovers he's been removed. And there's an account pin and he's been discovered by his ex-wife and lawyer. Honestly, OP saved them some money trying to track down that ex-husband. I'm kind of curious. When you're in a relationship and you eventually break up, let's say your ex was paying for stuff like Netflix or Spotify and stuff like that, would you still keep using that for as long as you could? Is it kind of shameless to do that? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Voodoo285. Which one of us will get bored of it first? I worked as a field engineer. They'd want you at a client site by 9 a.m. They'd expect you to stay there till 5 p.m. Most clients would take you 75 minutes to reach, so two and a half hours per day travel on top of on-site work. My office, which was my contracted base, was a 70 minute drive away. I didn't mind doing the extra time because I was told to make sure I don't lose money. So abandon triangular mileage and bill the mileage from home to client and back. Strictly speaking, you are meant to use triangular mileage, which means that if your office is 30 miles away and your client is 50 miles each way, you could only bill for 40 miles instead of the 100, as you have to subtract your home to office and back mileage from your home to client and back total. HR realized my mileage wasn't being done triangular. I spoke to my bosses as they were coming down on me hard. He was extremely unsympathetic. So I said, okay, I'll drive to the office and set off from here to a client at 9 a.m. and be back by the office at 5 p.m. and go home from there. Not only would that cost them more in fuel, but also massively reduced client time. I finished it off with, I'll do that and see which one of us gets bored of it first. Turns out they did. I got canned about a month later, but I walked into a far better job with a substantial pay bump too. Best of all, no more driving. Before the conversation went sour, I suggested they solve the issue by putting my place of work as my home so I could bill from there instead. I tried all sorts, but they just had to have it their way. 
It really sucked because it was costing so much to actually work there with the excess hours and fuel costs. Sometimes you just can't win. This is one of those weird situations where it's like, they're not even doing it for like cost saving or efficiency. They're only doing it because they want you to like submit and comply to them. It's just a really weird mindset altogether. This next story is by Lord Komote. You need to write a manual for that. A few years ago, I worked for a mildly successful healthcare provider. While the pay wasn't good, the team dynamic was great, and things moved along smoothly. But like a lot of stories here, awesome boss left and now things sucked with the new boss, whom we'll refer to as boss. Shortly before that, I took a role that, despite a decent sounding title, was severely underpaid compared to anyone with a similar title even within the same company. Every year, I would lobby for a raise, but every year, I get turned down for one reason or another. The company didn't really perform well enough, you need to improve your skills first, but on your own time and expense, your bandwidth usage is too high, yes, that was actually a reason given to me. After too many failed attempts to get a raise, I decided it's malicious compliance time. I'm just going to limit my output according to the scale of what I'm being paid. I stopped using all the shortcuts to my task and just did them all the hard way. Like, why use an Excel macro when I can do the same thing manually? Need someone on that project? Go find someone else. I'm too busy doing these things the hard way now. Need an analysis? I'd state the obvious within a couple of sentences. Sometimes I'd even just send a spreadsheet with the raw data and say, here you go. Need this yesterday? I could have actually have done this task in 10 minutes, but because I'm not paid to do that, I'll get back to you tomorrow. The final straw was when they hired a trainee to assist me, but somehow gets involved in projects and even spent a weekend modifying my templates without my knowledge. Come Monday, I got in hot water for using their new templates. It was obvious that I was being managed out. Well, two can play this game. As it happens, while they were tweaking my templates, I was working on a new one of my own, and they were quite similar. Boss agreed to let me use the new one, but that I should write a manual on how to use it. Well, sure I can do that. You see, Boss didn't specify how detailed that manual should be, so I just wrote something like, Step 1, open template. Step 2, download data. Step 3, copy chart to PowerPoint. Step 4, send the report. No indication which template to use, where to get the data, what to put in the slideshow, or who to send the report to. Also, I spent a whole day just figuring out which font to use because why not? That done, I filed for two weeks leave that somehow got approved. I reasoned trainee is there anyway, and if he gets stuck, he could use the manual. On the last possible moment of the last working day before my leave starts, I handed in my two weeks notice as per my employment contract. Days later, I got a call from a work buddy telling me that trainee is splitting hairs trying to comprehend what my manuals are talking about. Asked if I could maybe help. Boss was too proud and too pissed to call me himself. Well, sure I'd love to come over and help, but I'm actually two time zones away now and too busy learning about my new job. I think this goes to show that if you're going to deny somebody raises and prevent them from promotions, shutting them down, berating them, just overall giving them a hard time and boxing them in, those probably aren't the kind of people you should allow to create the fundamental systems for which you're trying to do work on. Cause being treated like that, they're probably not going to stick around and they're probably not going to give you too much help on trying to figure it out. This next story is by Dodohead974. You scheduled a meeting with senior executives on my last day. Cool, but you made me return all my equipment, remember? So for background, I recently changed jobs. I wore two hats at work for 18 months during COVID, and when year-end reviews came around, I got a meeting expectations and a 3% raise. Everyone else on our team of six got promoted. Needless to say, I felt the love and found a new job. So I've got my offer and accepted, but before putting in my two weeks, I realized I'd accumulated personal days to the tune of eight days. I scheduled vacation so that for my last two weeks, I'd only have to work Monday and Tuesday. I made sure it was approved in our system and then tendered my resignation effective in two weeks. Now, I know this is kind of a crap way to do it, but I wasn't worried about burning bridges and they don't pay out personal days, only vacation days, so I wasn't going to lose those days. Anyways, over the weekend, I get emails, phone calls, and texts from my manager Some angry, some in disbelief, some accusatory. It was a lot. 
Come Monday, what do you know? There's a meeting with my manager and the executive director first thing in the morning. Call goes exactly like you'd imagine. I'm called unprofessional, I'm leaving them in a bad situation, why didn't I talk to them if I was unhappy? I had, blah blah blah. We finally get to the point where they just flat out ask me what it's going to take to get me to stay. So I reply, permanent work from home and a promotion, to which the executive director chuckles and says that's not going to happen. And then I add, and give me a 50% increase, which would be 2% more than what my offer was. You could hear the freaking crickets through my noise-canceling Plantronics Voyager headset. Long story short, they're both irate at this point and tell me I need to return all company property, laptop, badge, etc., ASAP or I won't get my last paycheck. Cue malicious compliance. You see, in my line of work, our teams collaborate, but we become the experts in our particular area of focus. And we were due to present to our C-suite and high-level execs on my area of focus on a Friday. The same Friday that happens to be my technical last day. That also happens to be the last day of my paid vacation. I saw my manager schedule the meeting a few hours after our lovely call and accept it. I did my work the rest of the day and Tuesday as well, signed off, got in my car, drove to our office and returned all my stuff to HR. They logged the return and told me I was all set. Now I start enjoying my paid vacation and as the next week starts, I figure midweek I'll get a text about the meeting reminding me about it despite being on PTO. Sure enough, that Thursday evening I get the reminder text to which I don't respond. Come Friday, 15 minutes before the meeting, I get another text. Are you ready for the call? I don't see you signed on. I respond this time, but Runtface, not a real name, I can't sign on. You told me to return all my equipment ASAP or I wouldn't get my last paycheck, remember? So I did what you said and returned it to HR last week. Did they not tell you? She never responded, but a coworker I still keep in touch with called me a few days later to spill the tea about the call and how no one knew my area. And someone high up at one point said, You're a team lead, but can't explain what your team was doing? Turns out she's been demoted and moved to another department, and I'm two weeks into my new job, happy as a pig in poop. I just think this kind of exposes how the way this whole department runs is just totally flawed in general. Like if one person just quits, or let's say, God forbid, explodes, you're just screwed and have no idea what's going on? And our final story of the day is by MCG42Ray. Charge a fee for my own money? It was only a $3 fee, but, you know, I'm cheap and easily annoyed by corporate greed. I live in Canada, near the border. Not all of us do, by the way. And banks here routinely offer both Canadian dollar and US dollar accounts. There's even ATMs where you can choose between US dollars and Canadian dollars for withdrawals. It's more convenient and cheaper than exchanging $100 from one to the other every time you want to do some cross-border business. The time had come to renew my US passport, and I needed a check for $130 US dollars. Personal checks are like $50 to get printed, and I'm cheap, so instead, I just stopped by my bank to get a cashier's check. Since I have US dollars in my account, I figure easy peasy, right? There's an $8 fee for writing a cashier's check, but it's only occasionally I can cope. Nice young chap helps me out. He looks at the computer and gets that pained look that says, Please don't hate me, but... It seems that my kind of account has an additional $3 fee for this kind of withdrawal. Sigh. But wait, there's ATMs in the lobby, and one of them dispenses US dollars, no fee. I ask the poor guy, can I just get the cash for the check from the ATM? He gets that sort of half-smile twinkle of people who are enjoying the compliance, even though he's supposed to be representing the bank, and says, Yes, I guess you can. I'll set your stuff to the side here while you go do that. Three minutes to get the $140 cash, 20s only, and when he finishes with the other customer, he takes the cash, issues me the check for $130, and says, I'll just deposit the extra 10 back into your account. Me with my best sincere customer smile said, Yes, please. Thanks for your help, and you have a good day. And off I go. Next stop, Canada Post. I don't blame OP. You go to the bank to withdraw the money you graciously keep with that bank, 
and they try to charge you extra fees because you want to withdraw it a certain way or use it a certain way. If you can save three plus dollars on any transaction and it only takes you like five minutes to do so, it seems worth it, right? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.